So I'm Jenny Krakava. Um, there are a few familiar faces on the call, but um, for those of you I don't know, I'm a, one of the community engagement managers here at the Community Foundation, and my primary role, um, or a significant part of my role, is um, managing grant making for the Basic Needs Giving Partnership, which we'll talk more about in depth later. Um, in terms of logistics, we have such a small group today, so we um, just ask during the conversation, mute yourself, but we will have times throughout the presentation for you to ask questions. Um, feel free to put those in the chat. I'll be monitoring that, but um, also with the small group, I think if you just want to chime in with your question, feel free to do that as well. And with that, um, I will hand it over to Carolyn to introduce herself, and then Tammy will get us kicked off. Good evening, everyone. My name is Carolyn Desrosiers, and I am also a community engagement manager with the Community Foundation. I've been with the foundation um, a little, uh, about three and a half years. I work with our Bright Idea Fund, which is what I'll be talking with you about tonight, um, with some of our affiliate funds and a number of other grant making programs throughout the foundation um, that usually are competitive processes or processes where there's a committee involved. And I'm really grateful that y'all took time out tonight to listen in. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tammy Geenan, Vice President of Community Engagement with the Community Foundation. And I see the rain just started outside, so I don't know if you can hear that in the background. I'm sitting in front of an open window. Um, I have been with the foundation for 21 years and have um, provided leadership in the marketing and communications area previously, and also work with um, Jenny and Carolyn in the Community Engagement Department which is involved with grant making, community leadership initiatives, and general community engagement um, in our region. Glad you're all able to be with us and take some time to learn and ask some questions. All right, Carolyn, next. So first, I um, wanted to start with a, with a thank you and acknowledgement of everything that each one of you have been doing during this uncertain, challenging time that we've all been living in since the spring. Um, we know that there have been a lot of needs in the community, um, that you've been doing a lot of great work to provide support, and that also just from a personal perspective, um, there's been a lot to deal with um, and to juggle. So. Um, really want to um, just share our, our gratitude and appreciation for all that you're doing and to know that um, we hear you, we see you, and the groundwork that we've laid for some of the changes to some of the grant-making programs we're going to talk about tonight um, have you and others in the nonprofit sector um, that are doing such important work um, all in mind. So with that, I want to provide just a, a little bit of background um, to get us started with the, the discussion around the changes, back in March, when the COVID crisis hit, the Community Foundation uh, was one of more than 700 organizations that signed the Council on Foundations Call to Action, Philanthropy's Commitment During COVID-19. And this commitment um, is really um, providing our pledge that we will act with fierce urgency to support the nonprofit sector um, during this pandemic and to help support organizations that are helping people that have been um, greatly impacted by the crisis. This involves us being flexible, responsive, good listeners, um, to really understand what our nonprofit partners are seeing um, and are dealing with and how we might be able to respond um, appropriately. Um, and also communicating um, proactively and consistently about changes. So that's part of what we're doing here today. Um, another aspect is to um, stay plugged into what is happening from a public policy perspective and to find ways where there might be a role um, to play. So from the listening perspective, um, both Carolyn, Jenny, and many others within the Community Foundation have been having lots of personal conversations with folks that are working in the nonprofit sector. And so we've been trying to use that feedback to determine some areas of focus and need 
um, with the programs we're going to be talking about tonight. And then underlying all of this is peak grant making's five principles for equitable grant making um, that you can see here. And these are in some cases aspirational goals, um, but is also reinforcing um, what has already been in place. But just know that we are also keeping this um, in our minds um, as we go forward. Next. So even though tonight we're going to focus on changes to the Basic Needs Giving Partnership and Bright Idea Fund grant making and provide an update on the COVID-19 Community Response Fund, also just want to make you aware that there are other grant opportunities that are available within the Community Foundation that have open application processes all throughout the year. And you can find those opportunities on our website um, at this URL. Um, so you can search um, under different um, funds that have processes that are open and um, learn those details and deadlines on our website. Any questions so far? Okay. Great, Carolyn. I'm going to talk now more specifically about our Bright Idea Fund and some of the changes for this fiscal year and our rationale and what you can expect when you're looking into those programs. Just a little bit of background for folks that might not be familiar. The Bright Idea Fund is the foundation's pool of unrestricted grant dollars. So those are dollars that have been entrusted to the foundation uh, by donors, many, some who have passed on, some who haven't, but um, up to our board and volunteer grants committee members that we work with to administer uh, to benefit the community. Three years ago, a little over three years ago, we transitioned that to be called the Bright Idea Fund and had three programs within the Bright Idea Fund where nonprofits could apply. We still have three offerings this year, but we've made some changes to them. Hopefully that will be um, there to help you um, as we all meet the challenges of COVID-19. Some of the things we took into consideration as we were considering what to do with their grant making this year was just an overall goal to help position nonprofits to be able to be responsive, to meet up to your challenges, to meet your needs, and also to sustain during this challenging time. Um, sadly, you know, we know like a lot of small businesses, there may be some nonprofits that don't make it through this time. We don't want to see that. So how can we be there for nonprofits to help them weather these times? Has been a really key theme in our discussions. The Bright Idea Fund has always had a number of focus areas. Most recently, there have been five focus areas that are arts and culture, basic needs and self-sufficiency, community development, environment, and nonprofit effectiveness. So organizations working within these focus areas have been welcome to apply, but we've also had a set of purpose and priorities in each of those focus areas that further define the difference that we're trying to make in the community. We had been on a trajectory to revise those priorities um, in line with new information from the Life Study, new information from the Imagine Fox Cities survey. But when COVID-19 hit, we realized it wasn't the right time to do that. And we've determined that the best thing for this year is just to sort of set those priorities aside for a little while, work within our focus areas as we have as to sort of key topic areas. And instead, we're going to be guided by values in our decision making, which I'll talk more about in a little bit. So we're trying something new there, working with values rather than these very specific priority areas. Our Bright Idea forums that we have been holding three times a year are suspended for this year. Um, some of you may have participated in them or, or looked into them. Um, we learned a lot from that program, but it was more so geared to innovative ideas, expansion of programming, and we know that's just not where a lot of people are at right now. We know you're still being innovative, but also you're working very hard to try to figure out how do you still do the things that you've committed to do. And we needed to make a pretty big shift with the dollars that we had normally put towards that program, which I'll talk about in just a moment. One of the things we want to commit to continue to do is to share what we're learning through the Bright Idea Fund, through our conversations with all of you, without, with, throughout the Community Foundation and with other funders when it makes sense. Um, hopefully that will help maybe save you time 
in telling your story or sharing information and um, be a way that we can rally people together around the needs that we're learning about. We're transitioning a lot of our work to more streamlined applications and also to all rolling deadlines. So in the past, we had some rolling deadlines and some more specific deadlines. This year, it's all rolling deadlines. And the grants committees are meeting monthly rather than like sort of quarterly or um, three times a year. And overall, we really want to be flexible and nimble. And we look to your feedback about how we're doing on that. Um, we really need to be responsive to you and meet your needs. Um, and we're making a lot of changes. So please know that we really value your feedback in this process. I mentioned those values, and I'll just read through them quick because I'm excited about that. I'm excited to be able to work in this different way and have different kinds of conversations with our committee members about how your proposals align with our values and with you about how our values align together. Uh, the first is respect, that we treat the people and organizations with whom we work with dignity and respect and as partners in our shared goal to improve individual and community well-being. Second is integrity. We steward resources responsibly, make thoughtful and transparent decisions, and we keep our promises and commitments. Teamwork. We serve our community best when we solve problems together, share resources, and listen to one another, especially to those with lived experience. I think that's really increasingly important. The fourth is diversity, equity, and inclusion. We are committed to appreciating and engaging diverse voices, removing barriers to opportunity, and eliminating disparities so that all people may thrive. And creativity. We embrace new ways of thinking, strive to take risks, and we encourage and support visionary ideas. Some of these values are things that we've maybe um, unofficially tried to do or begun to experiment with. Like, for example, in our Bright Idea Forum, we were taking more risks in the things that we were funding, but we felt it was important to articulate these things, share them with the community and share them with you and be able to talk about them. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the specific programs that we're offering this year, all the detailed guidelines can be found on the website. I'm just gonna hit some of the highlights for you and then give you a chance to ask questions. Uh, probably our largest offering this year and what's really replacing the funding that we normally would use in our Bright Idea Forum are bridge grants. These are grants to help sustain nonprofits that are facing significant financial need caused by COVID. Um, and this includes all nonprofits that have been supported via our, our, those five key focus areas. It's modeled after a program that we did in 2009 that was also called Bridge Grants after the recession. We were able to take a look back at that and use some of what we built at that time to help um, now in this crisis. So the, the crises are very different. <laughs> Requests can be made for up to $25,000 of general operating support. It's a one-time, at this point, single year grant uh, modeled after that program that I mentioned. Um, grant amounts will, will range within that. Um, when we ask people to share their financial need with us, we want to know what the full financial need is. We want to understand the big picture, but the maximum amount that would come from the Bright Idea Fund is $25,000. We will be sharing those applications with your permission. Um, I'm skipping ahead, I guess, a little bit with others. Um, so perhaps there might be additional funds that come from donors within the foundation, other funders. Um, but at a maximum from the Bright Idea Fund, it's that $25,000 limit. It's important that the organization is able to demonstrate prior financial health and a high potential for future stability. Um, yesterday, we had a great question, what is a high potential for future stability? It's your best um, creative ideas about how you think you're going to make it through this time. It's um, you know, a description of the conversations that you're having with your staff or with your board or the work that you're trying to do to make um, plans. Um, to weather this time. So there's no silver bullet. We don't have any expectation that like, of course, this organization is going to make it. Um, but it'll be by asking questions of you of what you think um, your future looks like that we'll get to that point. It excludes churches, schools, and government organizations, and also fiscally sponsored organizations or um, organizations that are programs of another organization. There's more of a financial assessment in this application than some of our other applications this year. And I already mentioned the sharing. So I'm the main staff, staff contact for that fund. And I am asking folks to check in with me before they begin that application. So it is password protected. Not that it's a secret. I just want to make sure that people understand what it is and that they're eligible before they begin working on it because I don't want anybody to be wasting their really valuable time. 
The next category is planning grants. We've offered planning grants for many years. So we're just kind of um, expanding and increasing um, our offerings to planning grants to respond to what the needs are right now. So these are small grants to help position nonprofits um, to sustain, to take action regarding equity, diversity, inclusion, which is something that's new, and just be able to work sometimes with that outside facilitator, that fresh set of eyes, that person maybe with some um, specific expertise to help you with your planning. So this can include business continuity planning, if you've never had a business continuity plan or maybe need to refresh your business continuity plan. Scenario planning, which is kind of similar but different. Um, and it's a, something new that we're still learning about. So we're hoping to provide some additional resources around what that is and who you might work with to do that. But we're finding and reading that that's really gonna be critical for people's success moving forward. And then planning or training to advance equity, diversity, inclusion within your organization. Um, we all need to do a better job with this. Um, there's, there's an urgent need to do that, but we know sometimes funding can be a barrier. We don't want that to be the case. So if your organization is looking to create a plan for how you become more inclusive um, or better meet the needs maybe of, of your diverse audience or clients, um, or there's a specific training that you'd like to provide for staff, volunteers, board members, those are the kinds of things we'd like to see there. Grants can be for up to $5,000. There is an 80-20 cost share, and what we pay for is the consultant or the facilitator costs. We can provide a list of possible consultants if you'd like that. Um, we try to curate a pretty decent list of folks that are available um, in the community. It's mostly community-based people, but one of the interesting things about COVID is now with everything going virtual, we have access to people around the country and around the world. Um, so also, if you know of people who are, are doing good work in any of these areas, please feel free to share that. It is a two-step application, so that means you complete a, an inquiry that gives us some of the basic details. We'll check it again, just make sure that it's a good fit before you move on to the second part where we ask for more details and it takes a bit more of your time. And I am the staff contact for that process. Our third area are our Bright Idea Fund Spark Grants. These should be familiar. We've offered Spark Grants the last several years. I like to think of these as um, a little bit of money to try something out, to, to try a neat idea. <clears throat> um, and we know that that still needs to happen right now. Um, there is a lot of creativity and innovation, but sometimes, again, that cost can be a barrier. It can be hard to, um, sometimes other staff members or a board say, you know, we just can't afford to try this thing right now. And we'd like for Spark to be an avenue for you to still do those things. Um, so it's gonna support events, projects, and programs that are virtually virtual or safely distanced. So still keeping the CDC guidelines in mind. Could also support software and hardware improvements that you need to be able to work differently. Um, or just like other alternative methods of connecting with people is kind of what we're focused on this year. Usually we've supported $25,000 for events, up to $25,000, no, $2,500 <laughs> for events, excuse me and up to $5,000 for projects or programs, just things that are longer term. We, um, in past years, have accepted more than one Spark application per organization in a fiscal year. This year, just due to the need and limited dollars, um, one Spark application is the limit for the fiscal year. So that's between now and June 30th of 2021. This is also a two-step application, again, just to check, check in and make sure um, your time is valued as you're filling out the application. And our staff contact for this fund is Tammy Geenan. One other thing to mention about this, this program is there is a 60 day uh, deadline. So 60 days prior to the start of the event, the program, um, maybe implementing your technology or software improvement, that's calendar days. Um, that helps us have enough time to thoroughly review application, maybe go back with questions, if there's advertising that has to happen for you to get an answer from us in time for all those things to happen. Those full guidelines can be found on the website at cfoxvalley.org slash bright idea fund. Please take a look at those um, before applying for sure, but know that you can call with more questions and we'll have time for questions right now too that um, Tammy and I are very happy to help guide you through the process. But we'll stop for questions. What questions do you have about our Bright Idea Fund this year? Do you have any idea what the um, reporting back process is going to look like this year? I'm really excited about that because that is also going to be different. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
we are looking at streamlining our reporting as well and offering people more options. Um, and we've already started doing that for existing grants. So grants that people got in the past, we've started doing things like instead of um, taking a written report, scheduling a phone call and recording notes or just recording the call, um, we realized that reporting is also an area that we need to be more streamlined, flexible and um, efficient. So for example, for the Spark process, if you were to get a grant, what you would then see are some options for reporting. If you have already written a report on that work that was funded by the grant for another funder, you can upload that. It, or if you haven't done that, and you, if you like writing, um, or you have someone who likes writing on your team, you could um, submit a one page narrative. You could ask to schedule a 30 minute phone call. Um, so it's gonna give you a number of options to make sure that we're responding to what seems to work best for you. And then also just some other upload boxes if you wanna put pictures, um, examples of what you did. Um, the bridge grant reporting is different. It's a little bit more involved given the greater amount of funding and, and also what we wanna learn from that. I mentioned doing those bridge grants now is different than doing them in 2009. You know, at that time, the recession was sort of like officially declared over. You know, we are still in the middle of COVID right now in the Fox Valley. We have these rising case numbers and the length of time that we're gonna be dealing with this challenges, these challenges is an unknown. And so there is a lot more that we'd like to learn from people about how these grants helped. Um, were they able to leverage them for other funding? What else do they need? Um, so the reporting for that grant is a little bit more in depth um, yet. Um, but our, and then our planning grant reporting is similar to the SPARK grant with those options that I mentioned. Thanks for that question. Yes, thank you. Other questions? Um, Carolyn, I have, I have a question about um, information sharing, I guess. I know, you know, one of the advantages of the forums and, and some of the things that um, were part of Bright Ideas as it was, you know, kind of traditionally offered was that opportunity to brainstorm with other people, get feedback on ideas, and just kind of know what was going on. Is there any um, form or format or anything where that idea sharing might be able to continue? Thanks for that question. Yes, one of the things we did as part of our Bright Idea Forum was we had monthly light bulb labs that were kind of a feeder for that. You could come share an idea, meet other people, and there were often just really great connections that would come out of that, in addition to making those forums kind of open. Um, we're still figuring out, I guess, what to do about this idea sharing and connection piece. We are gonna be offering virtual office hours just as a chance for folks to meet one-on-one -on -one with um, myself, Jenny, or Tammy. Um, but I appreciate that question. That's something we have to think more about. And um, I guess I like kind of just look to the folks on this call for feedback. I, I sometimes worry that maybe people are like Zoom called out. <laughs> um, there's a lot of, maybe people are taking advantage of their professional associations, um, other cohorts they're a part of you know, would there be an interest yet in um, sort of those light bulb laddish type calls um, regarding grants that you all might have? You could nod or unmute and say something. Just curious about that. Seeing some nodding. Um, yeah. I know the um, AFP chapter has done, you know, these kind of coffee and wine chat kinds of Zoom opportunities where we've been able to do some small group discussion and and maybe it's um, some more partnership to get the word out on just those kind of more free form opportunities for people to connect. Um, and, you know, maybe there isn't need to do something super structured and formal, but I do feel like sometimes I'm in the same Zoom call with the same people. Mm. And, you know, so getting that wider perspective um, is sometimes something that I'm missing. Yeah. Well, thanks for that suggestion. That is one of the cool things we saw in that light bulb lab is uh, we'd have an arts organization come and learn from a human services organization, learn from an environment organization, and just there was great collective learning in that. So thank you for bringing that up. And that's something we'll have to um, think more about and communicate back out about. Any thank other you. questions? I think we can take one more um, before we- Yeah, Carolyn, I, I need a re refresher with my memory for indicating before the bridge grant to indicate our what our financial need is, you know, our of course um, budget year starts May first till the end of April next year. Do I start with that date as to what our deficit will be, or can I even go back to the beginning of COVID in March? 
that's a great question. The, so the financial section of the application is going to ask you to report things based on your fiscal year. But given that your fiscal year just started, um, in the narrative sections, I would, I would encourage you to add a, more detail about what happened before May. And it's also going to ask for two years prior, not like full financials, but a snapshot of your financials in the two fiscal years prior. So the committee will get some picture of that already. Um, but please do kind of do your best to give us the whole picture of how COVID has impacted you. And you know, that's something we can look at that section of the application together too, if that's, that seems tricky. Good question, thank you. All right, I think I've gone over my time, so I'm gonna turn it over to Jenny. Okay, get us caught up. Um, hi, again, I'm Jenny. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the changes. Um, some significant changes I hope um, those of you who've been through the process before will be happy to hear. And um, so a little bit of background about the Basic Needs Giving Partnership um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it. It was formed back in 2008 as a strategic funding alliance between the J.J. Keller Foundation and um, the U.S. Venture Schmidt Family Foundation. And funds are raised um, for grant making through the partnership through the annual U.S. Venture Open Golf Outing that occurs in August. Um, the Basic Needs Giving Partnership, it includes corporate and philanthropic partners, U.S. Venture, J.J. Keller Foundation, Oshkosh Corporation, Theta Care, Thrivent, um, the Greater Green Bay Community Foundation, um, our community foundation here, and the Oshkosh Area Community Foundation. So I oversee the grant making for the Fox Valley dollars, um, and I have a counterpart in Green Bay and Oshkosh, and we also have regional funding opportunities as well. So um, the Basic Needs Giving Partnership supports nonprofit organizations working collaboratively uh, across a broad spectrum of programming. So um, our priority areas are education, physical and mental health, economic stability, um, that includes jobs, housing, transportation, childcare, um, family support, and social connectedness. Um, we really are focused on ending poverty and working in partnership with community groups across the region to advance systems change. Thanks, Kelly. You can go ahead to the next slide. So back in November of 2019, pre-COVID, we actually had embarked on some strategic work because um, for years, the focus of the Basic Needs Giving Partnership has been addressing poverty and root cause, um, but um, saw a need based on there was a lot of learning going on and a deeper understanding of poverty and root cause that we need to kind of look at how can we be more strategic and from a funding perspective and making sure that we're really investing in things that are moving the needle on poverty in our community. So out of that work so far, um, it's an ongoing process for the next year. Um, we have a revised purpose statement and I apologize, I have to minimize my screen here so I can read it all. Um, all right. And you can read it all on the screen there too. But the Basic Needs Giving Partnership's purpose is to address the systemic root causes of economic inequality by supporting and partnering with leaders, organizations, regional networks who work to advance shared economic prosperity across Northeast Wisconsin. To this end, the Basic Needs Giving Partnership creatively deploys the collective assets of the partnership, including its learning and its voice. Historically, the Basic Needs Giving Partnership has been known for um, planning grants, for maybe capacity building, um, piloting a new program, um, and multi-year funding to kick off new, new projects and really focused on innovation and really looking at that systems change work. Um, in addition to funding and grant dollars, we're also seeing the need, especially in this moment, um, that a lot of the programs the problems that the Basic Needs Giving Partnership has been focused on have just been amplified with COVID, um, the um, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor murders, um, and, and there's, so there's a lot with race and equity that's coming up too that we really need to address and want to add um, a lens, an equity lens to our grant making. So some changes coming up. Thanks. Um, in addition to the annually budgeted dollars for grant making this year, the Basic Needs Giving Partnership has released an additional $5 million across the region um, for grant making. So in the Fox Valley, that means an additional $2,025,000. Um, this year, there's no change to the impact areas that I listed off earlier. 
Um, but there is a change to how we're going to go about grant making this year. We've learned a lot, um, those of us working within the community foundations, through the COVID-19 um, response funds that each of our organizations has set up and really saw the, the need for more responsive grant making, um, streamlining process, really emphasizing trust and relationship, um, and tying into the pledge that Tammy alluded to earlier in the, in the program tonight. Next slide. So in terms of flexibility, um, the first step in requesting a basic needs giving partnership um, grant is still to contact me. So I am the staff um, contact for that. Um, and then we have um, an application. And in, in terms of the funding support, sorry, I'm going, I'm jumping ahead to my bullet points here. The one big change I think that people will be excited about this year is that we are um, open to funding general operating support this year. Those additional dollars are really to help stabilize, address emergency um, needs that organizations may have, um, just related again to that general operating support, changes in service delivery models. Um, so that, that's an exciting change. And related to that is removing the restriction requiring collaboration. Um, that said, we still, the reason, you know, I think behind releasing these additional dollars is seeing the need for this short term relief, but we also want to continue to keep our eye on these longer systems change um, projects. And so how can we take advantage of this moment where there is an opportunity right for change um, and make sure that our nonprofit organizations, our social safety net in our area is equipped to take on those challenges. We've drastically reduced the size of the application. Um, so for those of you who've been through the process, that is um, very exciting. We also want to simplify. Um, so if you have a request for funding out to another funder that you've already prepared, we're open to just sending us a copy of that. Um, the budget section is, is much simpler. You can upload uh, your existing budget in its existing format. Um, so just trying to add some, some simplicity and um, flexibility around that so we can make that process easier on you. So we can provide, as it says, our direct support to your organization and or community regional systems level support, so through collaborations. And then we do have a regional grant making process. So if you're an organization that serves multiple regions within the Green Bay, um, Fox Cities, and Oshkosh areas, um, you may be eligible for a regional grant. Or if you have a project that reaches at least two out of three of those other service areas. Um, another change to our grant making is we are moving to rolling grant cycles. We used to have um, two cycles per year. And now um, we are going to have a rolling deadline um, so you can submit grants as you need them. Uh, and our grants committees will start meeting monthly, which they're, we're just bringing them on board. We had our first orientation last weekend. Um, they're very excited about a lot of the changes um, ahead, including those extra monthly meetings. But um, just ask uh, in the program yesterday, I mentioned that we are building the plane a little bit as we're flying it. Um, so just ask for your patience, your grace, your constant feedback. Um, I've already gotten a couple questions on the application, which are very valuable. Um, we really wanted to get things out there, but your input um, is always welcome. So thank you for that. Um, I guess I'll add one more thing about our grants process. Typically, um, we did have an interview as part of that process. And that is no longer going to be a required element of um, applying for a basic needs giving partnership grant. So um, we'll kind of look at the project um, and, and determine if an interview is needed really based on the size and scope of the project. I think. So I guess if there, I don't know if there is a time for questions. I'm sure I missed things. <laughs> There's a lot to talk about. One thing that's come up in, um, you know, Carolyn, I think mentioned it and, and Tammy as well, the three of us, we're, we're a team and we work very closely together. And so what we want to do as well is um, not have you have to replicate the process. Um, you know, if you have a project that might be eligible for a number of grants that are being discussed today, um, you know, we'll, we'll work with you to find out what's the best point of entry for that and then how we can share and then maybe talk about opportunities for co-funding some of those projects as well. 
Jenny, I have just one question. It, um, will basic needs still be doing um, multi-year grants or are they going to step back from that a bit? Thank you. No, I did. I wasn't explicit on that. So yes, we have our traditional grant making that we're known for. And we, we definitely want to still see those projects coming through that are multi-year collaborative, really focused on systems level changes, addressing root causes of poverty. Um, that is definitely still vitally important, but just recognizing the need, um, the additional need this year and um, some of that stability that we know organizations need in order to continue to think creatively and collaboratively about these big, big problems. Thank you. No further questions. Back to you, Tammy. Or who was <laughs> Yeah. Okay. All right, so I'm going to provide just a brief update on the COVID-19 Community Response Fund and answer any questions that you might have about that. Um, so back in March, when everything was beginning to shut down in our community, the desire for individuals, businesses, and organizations to provide help um, in the community was increasing. And we came together with uh, United Way Fox Cities and on March 17th created the COVID-19 Community Response Fund to provide a mechanism for people and businesses in the community to respond as the crisis was beginning. Here, we can go ahead and advance. So since March 17th, total donations to the fund have exceeded a little more than $1.5 million and grants awarded um, are $1.2 million. So we have a little more than $300,000 um, in the fund right now that we're continuing to use to provide grants. And initially when the fund was created, we had the intention of having different grant phases to help meet what we anticipated would be changing needs as the crisis continues. So we moved um, into a phase two of grant making um, a couple of months ago um, and decided to continue to focus on Fox Valley Region nonprofits providing basic needs services to vulnerable and marginalized groups of people who have been disproportionately affected um, by the pandemic and economic crisis. This includes providing short-term support to organizations as they're reopening facilities and restarting or reinventing their services. So we made um, just a, a slight tweak based on where we started from, from phase one um, to provide that short-term support to some organizations that were trying to reimagine how they were going to be moving forward. Um, but I just found um, the need still exists to focus on um, the, providing those basic needs services. The funding priorities have also remained consistent, housing and safe shelter. Um, financial assistance, child care, health and well-being, vulnerable and marginalized populations, um, and food. And we are still accepting um, grant requests to that fund. And on the next slide, um, you can see um, where you can find more details and information on our website. And United Way is providing um, the email capacity for um, organizations to share their needs and um, ask um, questions regarding requests. So we're continuing to do grant making out of the fund. Um, the donations into the fund have slowed um, as the crisis um, has continued, um, but this is a fund that we are able to keep open um, as long as needed um, and can give fundraising another boost as needed. Um, it's designed to be flexible and responsive. Um, so as of right now, we're continuing that grant making work um, and the grants committee consisting of representatives from United Way and the Community Foundation um, continues to meet uh, almost weekly to make sure that we're, we're learning about um, needs and uh, continuing some direct outreach um, to organizations um, to make sure that we are uh, meeting the needs throughout the Community Foundation's um, service region uh, and within United Way service region as well. 
Any questions about that fund? The community has been incredibly generous and um, we've, as I think Jenny and maybe Carolyn both referenced, we've learned a lot through rapid response grant making through the COVID fund and are bringing a lot of those learnings into the changes that, uh, that you've heard us talk about um, regarding the Bright Idea Fund and Basic Needs Giving Partnership. I'll just take on to that. It was really exciting um, to be able to make those $1.2 million in grants and be a part of that team with really no formal application. You know, it started with that email to United Way. Some people would write very short bit and then our response was usually to set up a phone call and do an interview. And it was from our staff members, notes from those interviews that we were able to make a lot of those recommendations for support. Um, so that taught us a lot about, you know, what's really required to um, meet people where they're at, to respond, to do it in a timely manner and meet the community in need. Um, so I'm, I'm proud of that work and, and also grateful for all of that um, time that we got to spend on the phone with folks that um, were really doing incredible things every day to keep their organizations running, to take care of them, their teams, and to help take care of the community. Sometimes not always taking care of themselves, so we hope you're all doing that. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But really um, incredible work that happened all across the board with that fund. So with that, if there are no further questions, any other, I guess, before we close up, um, just if any other questions related to any other funds have come up that anyone wants to ask call? We love questions. <laughs> no question here. I just want to say thank you to how responsive you guys have really been. I know you guys have been adjusting your platform and we're all trying to figure things out together. And I just want to say that it's really been great being able to work in this capacity, this, this new way. That's what we aspire to continue. So it's nice being able to meet all of you and see all of your faces. <laughs> Carolyn's the only one I really knew. <laughs> I'll be in touch tomorrow, Carol. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> That's the idea. <laughs> all right. So thank you all for joining us today. We want to thank you again for um, just all the amazing work you and your organizations are doing to, to continue on through these, these heavy um, times, but that are ripe for real great opportunity and change. Um, you will be receiving an email following up um, on this presentation with a little survey. So we would love to get your feedback. Um, and also there's going to be a link to those virtual one-on-one uh, -on -one meeting opportunities as well. So. Um, please watch your inbox or check your junk mail um, to make sure that you get that. 